in the beginning, part 10. Genesis and creation, implications of a Christocentric understanding. We've been studying the book in the beginning, subtitled Science and Scripture Confirm Creation, written uh, by a number of different people, but edited by Brian Ball, who uh, contributed, to, to contributed uh, two chapters. And uh, Brian Ball was uh, in, born in Devon, England, got his MA from Andrews University, PhD from the University of London, then became a church pastor evangelist, eventually the North England Conference president, and then moved to Australia where he became principal of Avondale College and eventually president of the South Pacific Division. And that's where things stand now. He is married to Don and they have three children. The book itself was written from a perspective that views scripture as decisive. As the introduction puts it, its authority takes precedence over all other sources of information concerning origins. Therefore, it is mostly about theology. It talks about evidence of her faithful transmission of the text, arguments against higher criticism, and for a view consonant with Jesus and the New Testament. And today we're going to talk about the uh, consonants with Jesus. It does include scientific chapters by Tim Standish, Grenville Kent, John Walton, James Gibson, and Ariel Roth. And we will be talking about um, Tim Standish's chapter tomorrow, or correction, next uh, week. It also deals with theistic evolution and evolutionary morality as the final two chapters. William Johnson uh, got his BA in chemistry. I have been unable to find out exactly where. Um, he did attend Avondale Com uh, College afterwards. So he has a, he has a background in chemistry. Uh, he, I think he feels just enough to be dangerous. He got his Ph.D. from Vanderbilt University in 1979, and his dissertation was on the book of Hebrews. Uh, he taught at Andrews University from 1975 to 1980. Of interest is that he was president of the Adventist Society for Religious Studies in 1979, which I believe was their first year. After... Uh, the Adventist Society for Religious Studies was felt to be not conservative enough by a number of Adventists who then formed the Adventist Theological Society. Um, so there is some hint that in Adventism he has been on the uh, less conservative side. He was editor of the Adventist Review from 1982 to 2006 little over 20 years, and uh, my understanding, as far as I can tell, is that he's now retired. He is married to Nolene, and they have some children, but I haven't been able to track that down. Um, William Johnson uh, surprised me as being in, in this book, um, but I was very pleased with the chapter. So I, I will begin presenting what he has to say. Um, for what it's worth, all of the words that are up there are his. Um, the, most of the ellipses are mine. There's one where he quotes somebody else and puts some ellipses in that are his. Um, the current controversy over creation and evolution that is roiling many Bible-believing churches cuts with particular sharpness among Seventh-day Adventists. Our most distinctive practice embedded in our name, the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath, is at stake in the debate. But even more is on the line, not just the Sabbath, but the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ. Our long-standing approach to the natural world forbids us from retreating into an obscurantist stance that refuses to face squarely the challenges pos posed by the scientific evidence. We hold that the scriptures are God's revelation to humanity 
inspired by the Holy Spirit, but we also believe that nature is God's second book. Not as perfect as the Bible, but nonetheless important to teach us about God and his character. Throughout our history, Adventists have encouraged study of the natural world and have held in respect those who have given their lives to that investigation. Our educational institutions include the study of science and the curricula at all levels, and some Adventists have become leading researchers in a variety of fields. In particular, we have fostered research in areas related to health so that Loma Linda University and Medical Center has become internationally recognized for cutting-edge research. For Adventists, therefore, the controversy between creation and evolutionary theory can never be reduced to an either-or acceptance of either the biblical data or the scientific. We believe that both have one author. We are compelled to wrestle with the tensions that arise from both areas. Thus, one finds in our church an organization unique in the Christian world, the Geoscience Research Institute. This body, set up and funded from the highest levels of the world church, has as its mission the very wrestling described above. Its staff are all dedicated Adventists and are all scientists with earned doctoral degrees from reputable universities. They endeavor to accomplish what a host of other scientists and a host of Christian believers have deemed impossible, the harmonization of the data from scripture with the evidence from the natural world. I am not a scientist. Although my early university studies focused on chemistry, I do not have the academic preparation or experience to engage scientists in serious discussion. However, my early exposure to science imparted an understanding of the scientific method with its amazing achievements and also its limitations. My contribution will be in the area of theology and philosophy where I have advanced academic preparation and a lifetime of teaching and reflection. This chapter is rooted in biblical theology and especially in the theology of the New Testament, the field of my expertise. The study proceeds in four stages and I'll just say this is a very concise outline of what he's going to be talking about. One, the question of where to begin the debate between creation and evolution. Two, the data from the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Three, relevant data from the rest of the New Testament. And four, the implications of that data for theory, uh, theories of origins. The chapter concludes with some brief re reflections that arise from the study. Question one, where to begin? Biblical studies of creation customarily start with the Bible's opening words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. These studies take up the issue of whether this statement encompasses the creation of the universe or is meant to apply only to our planet. And then he discusses the with earth without form and void, the days, various other issues that you can get into. And he finishes with that, uh, that with commencing the study of creation with Genesis makes good sense. It begins where the Bible begins and establishes the agenda for debate with those who argue for a different view of origins. But is Genesis indeed the best place to begin? For the Christian, it is not. The New Testament recognizes a beginning prior to the in the beginning of Genesis 1.1. The opening words of the fourth gospel point us to this ultimate beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Before time, God the Word. Before the Genesis 1 beginning, God the Word. Before the universe, God the Word. Is this not the place to begin with the one who is eternal, who has no beginning and no end, in whom is life original, unborrowed, underived? And then we read on. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, 
and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood, and these are his brackets, or overcome it. And the reason why is because the Greek word can be understood in both senses. And perhaps when John wrote it, he meant it in both senses. Here is the creator, the word, who speaks order out of chaos, speaks light out of darkness, speaks the visible out of the invisible, speaks into being something out of nothing. Apart from the word, nothing. Through the word, everything. This is where we must begin, with the word who created it all. The text rushes on to an even more startling development, one that ancient and modern philosophy cannot encompass. The word became flesh and lived for a while among us. And I've omitted the rest of the quotation since it's familiar to most of you. Would we seek to understand the world, the universe? We must look first to the one who brought it all, all into being. We must study to di discover what he is like, and in light of that knowledge, turn to investigate the works of his hands. This chapter, therefore, develops a thesis that seems disarmingly obvious, but is e easily overlooked. The proper study of creation begins with the Creator, Jesus Christ. For the followers of Jesus, they from who, uh, they for whom, that's my typo, I'm sure, he is uh, Savior and Lord. He is not, cannot be, just another piece in the puzzle of humanity and its origins. He is not, cannot be, the Omega Man at the summit of the evolution of the race. That's a reference to Teilhard de Chardin, whom we'll see later. He is the RK, the origin of all. He is the first and the last. Uh, by the way, the arche is the Greek word from which we get archaeology, ancient things. He is the one from whom the entire universe came into being and to whom it will return to own him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Only in the light of Jesus Christ can we take up the controversy between creation and evolution. And in his light, the issues emerge with startling clarity. The life and teachings of Jesus. The first and most obvious conclusion to be drawn from as the study of the Gospels is that Jesus presupposed the validity of the Genesis account of creation. When Pharisees came to test him by raising the question of divorce, he replied, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Matthew 19, and it's also quoted in Mark. In his answer, Jesus alluded to the narrative of man's creation in Genesis 1.27 and quoted verbatim the Creator's words concerning marriage in Genesis 2.24. I think that it's actually quoting 127 verbatim as well, and of course, in the beginning is a quote as well. Again, speaking to his disciples about signs of the end times, he stated that, quote, those days will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning, when God created the world, again, in allusion to Genesis 1-1, until now. On several other occasions, Jesus referred to the creation or beginning of the world, and the references are there. Jesus' view of the world was a positive one. His favorite term for God was Father, and he used it to indicate God's relationship not only to humans, but to the creation. Look at the birds of the air. This is, of course, from the Sermon on the Mount. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. See how the lilies of the field grow. Those are, by the way, my ellipses. 
If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? In these words, Genesis go, uh, Jesus goes beyond the Genesis 1 account. There, at the end of the creation week, God pronounced everything very good. Here, God watches over his creation, lovingly cares for it in all its aspects, providing for its needs like a loving earthly parent with his or her child. Jesus was no ascetic, and he gives some examples, but all is not goodness and light in this world. There is a dark side. Jesus spent most of his time in a healing ministry. What happened to mar the original creation? Jesus did not reveal the answer. In one of his parables, however, he perhaps gave a clue. In the story of the weeds that grew up with the wheat, he said, an enemy did this. When his disciples asked him about a man born blind, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? He replied, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Then, shelving for a moment the question of evil, he proceeded to restore the man's sight. Jesus was keenly aware of demonic forces that opposed his work, both natural and supernatural. For Jesus, Satan was an all too real sinister being who exercised power in the world. If the Heavenly Father watched over his creation, Satan had been given access and authority as the prince of this world. And again, references there. In the ministry of Jesus, however, a new day was dawning, one that would break the yoke of Satan and at length restore the whole creation to its original purpose. In the work of Jesus, a new order of society was being born. It would bring a new hope a new people, and a new creation. It was already here, it had begun, but only at the eschaton would it be fully realized when God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. The hallmark of this kingdom was a marvelous quality outside all the religions, that should be religions, I'm sure, that the world ever saw Grace. Grace flowed from a God infinitely merciful and kind, who spared no effort to unite lost men and women to himself. In this kingdom where God rules the heart, the ambition, jealousy, and self-seeking that characterize human interaction on this earth have no part. Not by force, not by scheming, not by favoritism, not by putting others down, not by brute strength that claws upwards on the shoulders of the weak crushing them under. Not by such means does God's kingdom grow and spread. The relationship of Jesus to death is especially instructive. Three times in the Gospels we find him in the presence of a corpse, the daughter of Jairus, the widow's son outside the town of Nain, and his friend Lazarus. Each time Jesus brings the dead person back to life. For Jesus, Death was not something positive, certainly not a necessary component of God's creation. It mentions in the ellipses that he wept. Jesus broke up every funeral he attended. And in the incredible climax to Jesus' incredible life and ministry, he himself entered into the experience of death and broke it up. All four gospel accounts devote disproportionate treatment to the closing events of Jesus' life, and all unequivocally affirm that he died on a cross, was buried, and rose again from the dead. Far from these facts being viewed as embarrassing, a leader who was executed by the Romans, they became a focal point of the new religion that broke upon the world with Jesus' resurrection. Death had been conquered. Thus, the life and teachings of Jesus are of the utmost importance to the question of origins. They not only inform our understanding of creation, but also of the great controversy between good and evil, Christ and Satan. 
In their light, we begin to grasp how God's original creative intentions have been undermined through the entrance of sin and death, and also how Christ's life and death counteract and reverse the satanic processes of evil and death. A Christological understanding of creation. Looking beyond the Gospels, we find throughout the New Testament creation accepted and proclaimed as the origin of the world and of humanity. Spelling out such creation references in full allows us to experience their cumulative effect. Turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. You created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The principal word employed by the New Testament writers in discussing origins is the Greek ktizo and its cognates a word that expresses the absolute sovereignty of God. We find no reference whatever, whatsoever to a word used in Greek literature in discussing, discussions of origins, demiurgeo. This latter word describes a shaping of the world from pre-existing matter and was used, for example, in the Gnostic writings that attributed our world to a lesser deity the demiurge, or demiurge, as they would have said in Greek of that day. Thus, the New Testament reiterates the record of Genesis. The world was created ex nihilo by God. It also underlines the basic goodness of the word, of the world, rejecting any tendency to asceticism. For everything God has created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received, uh, I think that's a double writing there, with thanksgiving. And although the creation in its present state is marred, it nevertheless reveals God. Humans who stubbornly refuse to believe stand condemned because they do not acknowledge what God has made plain through his created works. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godness godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without any excuse. I skipped it paragraph there. The New Testament writers take a big step beyond the Old Testament, however, in the place they assign uh, to Jesus Christ on the issue of origins. The tra transcendent words of the Apostle Paul, perhaps quoting an early Christian hymn, ring with praise to Christ as the creator of all things. And this is, of course, from Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Again, I skipped a paragraph. Colossians 1, 15 through 18 makes the following affirmations concerning Christ. One, he is supreme over all creation. Two, by him, everything was created in heaven or on earth, the universe, in other words. Three, everything was created for him. He is the purpose of the creation. Four, he existed before all. He is the first not only in authority, but in time. Five, all things hold together in him. Six, he is the arche, the beginning. For the person who believes in Jesus Christ, these ringing affirmations must be determinative in shaping their view of the origin of this world and life on it. 
Other New Testament passages reiterate these affirmations in part or in whole, and um, then he quotes uh, three passages in particular that do that. This emphasized Christological perspective on creation is further developed in two aspects, a new creation in Christ and the restoration or recreation of all things made possible by the work of Christ. Central to the New Testament proclamation of the gospel is the teaching that in Christ, God already has inaugurated his kingdom, which is a new creation just as much as was the original one. It is stated frequently, for we are God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ to do good works. And then he quotes several other passages. It is surely impossible to miss this consistent, repeated New Testament emphasis on the new creation in Christ. While the new, this new creation made manifest in the transformed lives of believers and in the church, which is Christ's body, where barriers of race, gender, and status have been abolished, is a present reality. It is not realized in its fullness. The best is yet to be. The new creation is a promise and foretaste of the consummation when there will be a new heaven and a new earth free from sorrow, pain, evil, and death. Then all creatures in heaven and on earth will unite in praising the Creator. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive honor and glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being, which is, of course, Revelation 4. The whole creation, now marred and blighted, will, as Paul affirmed, be restored to its original purpose. And then he quotes Romans 8, 19 through 22. Thus, does the New Testament place Jesus Christ at the heart of its understanding of origins. He is the Arche, the beginning, and he is the Amen. He is the new man, foreshadowed by Adam, and he is the one who at last, crowned with glory and honor, with everything under his feet, which is Hebrews, which is taken from the Psalms, will be the end of all creation. Again, in the words of Paul, when the times have reached their fulfillment, God will, and that's his uh, bracketing, bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. This pervasive New Testament Christological view of the universe has profound repercussions for current theories of origins. To these theories, to those theories, we now turn. Implications for theories of origins. Theories of origins are only that, theories. While all pre present various lines of argument, all because of the nature of the subject, lack final proof. All attempt to move back in time from the is to the was, especially the first was. The various theories of origins current today may be grouped into three broad categories, naturalism, supernaturalism, and modified naturalism. How does each fare in light of the Christo Christological perspectives that per permeates the New Testament view of beginnings. The current controversy over creation and evolution that is roiling many Bible-believing church, uh, this, I'm sorry, that should have disappeared. Um, naturalism, a thoroughgoing naturalism sees the universe as a closed system of cause and effect in which everything, including origins, is to be understood as wholly proceeding from natural causes. God has no place in this schema since he is considered to be unnecessary and irrelevant. One of the clearest statements of thoroughgoing naturalism and its implications was made by the atheistic philosopher mathematician Bertrand Russell more than a century ago. In his essay, A Free Man's Worship, written in 1902, he wrote that man is the product of cause, uh, I think that should be causes and that's probably my typo, which have no provision, uh, no prevision of the end they were achieving. That his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, 
his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocation of atoms. That no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. That all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. And that the whole temple of man's achievements must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Quite a statement. And then he refers to some other people in that same camp, such as Richard Dawkins. How they ended Western thought, heavily influenced by the scriptures and the Protestant Reformation undergo such radical change? The answer is complex, deserving of a study in its own right. Here we will note just three key factors, the development of the scientific method, the impact of critical scholarship on faith in the Bible, and the influence of ideas from philosophy and psychology. And I think he pretty well nailed it on that. The scientific method Students of nature discover that the world could be investigated on its own terms with reference to the Bi without reference to the Bible or the supernatural. And I think that's my typo. Nature operated according to fixed norms or laws. Of itself, the scientific method was neutral towards the supernatural. It neither affirms nor denies it, but it does not require the supernatural as a factor in its investigations and thereby opens the door to those who, for whatever reason, wish to deny it. Another offspring of the Enlightenment was the rise of critical study of the Bible. This development may be viewed as an extension of the scientific method to the field of sacred literature. Considerations of supernatural intervention are bracketed off as being outside the purview of this apply, uh, applied scientific method, which means, of course, if they're really there, you'll never see them. Belief in miracles, in the virgin birth, in the resurrection, all perforce were now excluded. And with them, of course, the creation story. The inexorable train of critical analysis reached to the very founder of Christianity, to Jesus himself. And then he comments a little later that the Jesus Seminar continues this line of approach. Yet another attack on Christianity arose as other scholars scrutinized the nature of religion itself. Ludwig Andreas Feuerbach, I, Feuerbach, sorry, my German is not very good, argued that the uh, concept of God is a projection of our own consciousness. Theology is really anthropology. Sigmund Freud, uh, set forth religion as an illusion, a wish fulfillment that people very much wanted to be true. The work of uh, Feuerbach and Freud, <coughs> along with others, thus accounted for a religion on wholly natural terms, in the same way that Darwin explained the world and its origins on wholly natural terms. Uh, just a parenthetical comment, I don't think that Darwin is the main culprit. I think the work was done before him. In spite of the widespread influence of a naturalistic understanding of the world, that view faces two major flaws in its schema. It ultimately cannot account either for the existence of the universe or for the overwhelming evidence of its design. And then he talks about the Big Bang, the in incredible complexity of the universe, and quotes Philip Johnson briefly. Uh, actually, I think he cites him rather than quotes him. Supernaturalism. The supernatural view of origins pos posits that there is a God and that he is the source of all. The supernatural view of origins is not opposed to science, nor does it disparage science. God reveals himself through his created works as well as through the scriptures. 
Since the book of nature and the book of Revelation bear the impress of the same mastermind, they cannot be speak in harmony. And he goes ahead and finishes a quote from the book Education. And uh, again, I, this is the Reader's Digest version. We're cutting a lot in order to give you a chance to talk instead of me reading an hour plus. The bottom line is this. The believer knows the creator and has been recreated through him. Contrast this attitude with that of the non-believer, whose perspective does not extend to include the supernatural. For him, nature is a struggle in which the strong survives and the weak, whether animal or human, perish. Nature is red in tooth and claw, as the writer Jack London, among others, vividly describes in his books The Call of the Wild and White Fang. Uh, these con contrasting attitudes toward nature cannot be reconciled. Thus, the question of origins raises issues of heavy significance that reach far beyond the Sabbath. Ultimately, the trustworthiness of the Bible as divine re revelation is at stake, and beyond that, God himself and Jesus as our Creator, Savior, and Lord. Modified naturalism. The biblical pic picture of the origin of origins is clear and consistent throughout creation by divine fiat. And by the way, for those of you who are wondering, that word actually comes from the Latin fiat, let there be, as in let there be light. In the relatively recent past, however, evidence from several scientific disciplines runs counter to this biblical scenario, and he refers to a couple of them. Theistic evolution or evolutionary creationism, he's talking about the third way. There is a God who employed evolution. Here we will simply note how the case is made by Pierre de, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, C.S. Lewis, and Francis S. Collins. De Chardin was a French philosopher and Jesuit priest who trained as a paleontologist. He took part in the discovery of the so-called Peking Man. And I might add, I think he was also involved in the Piltdown Man somehow. And he says, among other things, and uh, these are my ellipses. He, I think he has one or two, but I might include his. Um, is evolution a theory, a system, or a hypothesis? It is much more. It is a general condition to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must bow, and which they must satisfy henceforth if they are to be thinkable and true. Shades of nothing in biology makes sense except for the theory of evolution. Man is the arrow pointing the way to the final unification of the world in terms of life. And then he talks about C.S. Lewis. Um, and he quotes from the problem of pain. For long centuries, God had perfected the animal from which it was to become the vehicle of humanity and the image of, of himself. He gave it hands whose thumbs could be applied to each of the fingers and jaws and teeth and throat capable of articulation and a brain sufficient to execute all the material motions whereby rational thought is incarnated. Then in the fullness of time, God caused to descend on this organism, both on its psychology and physiology, a new kind of consciousness which could say, I and me, which could look upon itself as an object, which knew God, which could make judgments of truth, beauty, and goodness, and which was so far above time that it could perceive time flowing past. We do not know how many of these creatures God made or how long they continued in the paradisal state, but sooner or later they fell. Someone or something whispered that they could become gods. And then Francis Collins in The Language of God. Collins' argument contains a striking inconsistency. On the one hand, his discussion of cosmology and the origin of the universe powerfully point to a degree of fine-tuning for which a designer is the most logical explanation. On the other hand, in treating human evolution, 
He dismisses all attempts to factor in the divine, either as an overarching principle or at specific moments of intervention in the development of new species. And nevertheless, according to Collins, God acted at a particular point in time, some 14 billion years after the origin of the universe, to invest the human-like creatures with an immortal soul that evolution could not instill. Arguing from humanity's sense of morality, Collins contends, humans are also unique in ways that defy evolutionary explanation and point to our spiritual nature. These three influential thinkers, how well do their views stand up when exposed to the litmus test of biblical Christianity? In my judgment, they are found wanting on at least seven counts. One, scripture. Talks about the Genesis account in the, in the New Testament, God is identified with Jesus Christ. Um, two, the character of Christ. Talks about a caring loving, merciful God, and the contrast to that with evolutionary theory. Three, sin and evil. Four, death. Five, Adam as a real person. Six, the work of Christ, which depends on these other things. And seven, that particularly in the case of uh, C.S. Lewis and um, uh, uh, Francis Collins, he doesn't pay that much attention to Teilhard de Chardin, probably because nobody else does either anymore. Um, they require the body to have come up one way and the soul to have become implanted on it in a manner that is not really biblical. And uh, then he gives some concluding reflections. The Christocentric approach to the issue of origins moves, like science, from the known to the unknown. Like science, its data can be replicated. The follower of Jesus Christ knows him as Savior, Lord, and Creator, Anyone who chooses may also gain that experiential knowledge. The believer knows Jesus as creator from two sources, the testimony of scripture and the testimony of the spirit in the heart. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. The question of origins boils down to either naturalism or supernaturalism. It is common today to attribute belief in the supernatural, miracles, divine guidance and intervention, and prayer that changes the course of events to a pre-scientific mode of thinking. But to accept that the supernatural is by no means outmoded or pre-scientific, the supernatural envelops the natural, and those who are open may discern its manifestations. Evidence for the supernatural arises from two sources, the believer's experience of God and happenings for which no natural explanation can be adju adduced. The person who believes in Jesus Christ, for whom he is Lord and Savior, know him as the risen one who has brought peace, deliverance, and joy. And he or she is not surprised to read accounts like that of Brother Yun in China, for whom prison doors open and the prayers of fellow believers bring about seemingly impossible circumstances, uh, occurrences. For Brother Yun and other Christians in China, the stories of the Book of Acts do not belong to an age long gone. They live again and are repeated in everyday experience. Supernatural and natural intersect, flow together, and are part of one, the one whole in Jesus Christ, who is creator and sustainer of life and the universe. In the light of Christ as creator, evolution, whether understood as a wholly naturalistic or as the naturalism modified by divine guidance or intervention is in inadmissible because it runs counter to the life and teachings of Jesus. Whatever theory of origins one assumes, problems remain. The supernatural approach derived from the Bible is not placed at a disadvantage beside other theories. Indeed, because of its certainty stemming from knowing the creator, it may have advantages. 
Nevertheless, it must face squarely data from the natural world that puzzles and troubles. Our knowledge of the distant past, that is of prehistory, is very limited. The first 11 chapters of Genesis provide but a sketch, an outline that leaves tantalizing issues unanswered. Among them are the following, the origin and demise of the dinosaurs and other creatures that seem monstrous to us, existence without death, the power given to Satan as prince of this world to intervene and manipulate natural processes and the extent to which he is engaged in such activities, and the effects of a worldwide flood on geology and paleontology. Reflections on origins inevitably is accompanied by an existential dimension. One cannot take it up without facing the biggest question of human existence. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I headed? Is there meaning to my life? At this level, the answers that result from evolutionary theory fall woefully short. It is not surprising, therefore, that after a century of teaching evolution in the public schools of the United States, the majority of people have not embraced the theory. In their innermost beings, they sense its inadequacy. I sense its inadequacy. In those aspects that make me most human, in worship, in morality, in appreciation of the beautiful, I know within myself that I am a child of Christ the Creator, made in His image. Now, I, I think that's a beautiful presentation. I agree with Dr. Johnson. Remember the book, The Defense of the Scriptural Story of Genesis, and there are several theological chapters. And then when it gets to there, we're talking about the New Testament last week and uh, specifically Jesus this week. And then we'll get into scientific arguments, ethics, and theistic evolutions. Uh, uh, and that's where this chapter fits in the book's uh, general approach. I just wish we had more time to read the whole chapter. It's very good. In this survey, I... I wish that somebody had made a major presentation as opposed to mentioning in passing several places on the relationship of love to the survival of the fittest. Um, that probably doesn't fall on uh, Bill Johnson. I was very pleased with the tone of the chapter, acknowledging uh, scientific problems uh, while not being overawed by them. Um, the opposition of naturalism with supernaturalism, I think, is very well outlined. Uh, and, by the way, this is why intelligent design is so important. Because if intelligent design is really the answer for some things, then it puts an intelligence that somewhere along the line eventually crosses the boundary of naturalism. And that's why it's fought tooth and claw by the scientific establishment, or at least the parts that are doing the fighting. Because the truth of the matter is, they know how critical this is, too. But that's my take, and now it's time for yours. Comments? Questions? Send it up. I'll give you charge of this one. This is, <clears throat> this is a bit of a smart aleck reply, but one of those quotes was, and I think it was from Francis Collins, um, talking about that at the end of evolution, somehow you have the instilling of the immortal soul into this animal, or maybe that was C.S. Lewis, I don't know. Um, uh, it was actually both of them. Um, the truth of the matter is, if, you, if you're going to have humans that are, uh, you know, morally responsible, they either have to be created that way, or somewhere it has to be put into them. And so they put it into them. And uh, they, sort of, to me, the comic aspect of that is evolution seems to accomplish everything else. 
uh, in, in the minds of those who believe so strongly in it, why can't it accomplish the instilling of, of an immortal soul as well? Um, and of course the answer is because that's beyond science or beyond naturalism and then is out of bounds uh, to the idea of something that evolution could do. Uh, no, it's a, it's a very valid point. And the point of it is that the whole purpose of this trying to get everything to fit into an evolutionary ta context and insisting it has to is precisely to avoid that point. So if you insist on that point, you're going to get um, a hung for stealing a lamb. You might as well steal the whole sheep. <laughs> See, the problem with this instilling of immortal soul, such as it is while we realize that the soul is not immortal, right, but uh, in the viewpoint of, of the other, uh, of, of the majority of theistic evolutionists. Um, that, that is a double conundrum because evolution cannot have immortality. Evolution demands death. It requires death in order for evolution to progress. And if the moment you introduce any f form of immortality, you're essentially starting to fight evolution. You're confronting and undermining the evolutionary process. So if you're going to be an evolutionist, you cannot possibly speak about immortal of anything. Well, see, this is the same problem you have with intelligent design. Um, the explanation that is being given has to be an absolutely 100% complete one. Um, I mean, you'll hear people saying that the uh, origin of life is outside evolution. But the more careful evolutionary philosophers know better. You can't have God cre creating life and then evolution taking off, even though Darwin said that. You know, in one of his other letters, he said he, you know, really was hopeful for the warm little pond theory. And, and, and that's, you know, that's basically what's going on, is you're trying to explain everything without reference to a creator. Well, if there really is evidence for a creator, never mind whether it's the creator we're talking about, that all by itself is enough to bother them. And then the implications of that creatorship are bother them even more. Because, as I think we've said before, basically, if it requires a creator to get Name your subject, life, intelligence, whatever, wherever God or wherever th this creator had to step in to intervene. Then, who created that creator? And the problem with that question, is, you know, this is the one that uh, Dawkins always says, well, what about who created God? Well, but if God is eternal, then you know, he doesn't have to have a creator. But For the, if you try to keep the creator as being a non-God figure, as being a natural figure, however intelligent, perhaps many more times intelligent than we are, but simply not divine, not supernatural in the strict sense, then there must have been a creator for that creator, and there must have been a creator for that creator, and uh, right now the estimate is about 13.7 billion years and you run out of time. And then the creator has to have its intelligence not based on the organization of matter, which means we're talking supernatural. 
And so the admission of intelligent design with only a very few reasonable logical additions destroys the whole project of explaining what we have without reference to the supernatural. And once you do that, why are we doing this whole process anyway? Why do we have to shoehorn everything into an evolution that doesn't look like it's really up to the job? In, in other words, let's put it this way. Supposing you come upon a scene. There's a person lying there dead. Okay. And the person has um, a knife in his back. And uh, in further investigation, uh, you find various other clues that could or could not point to this being an accident. The guy backed into a knife that was sticking out of a uh, cupboard somewhere, you know, whatever. You can argue, but then you find a note on the knife and it says, you know, something like, I wanted him dead. Well, you know, at, at that point, why are we discussing this? You know, just, just admit that this is a murder and, and, and then move on from there and stop trying all of the non-murder explanations. And that's really what's going on. And I think that I'm encouraged because at one point I would not, I would have had my doubts for um, how William Johnson would pro approach this. And he seems to have come out, you know, in, in this thing, I wouldn't say come out swinging, but certainly come out um, uh, very firmly with the idea that if you're going to be a true Christian, you can't go there. Um, so I'm, um, I'm very pleased with the chapter, and I think it makes an important point. We have a one back here. There's an interesting book called The Ultimate Proof, and I apologize, I don't remember the author, but he does do a good job of explaining that the most consistent worldview has to have a creator that has morals, that has intelligence, and so forth, in order to explain why those things exist, and it is. He does a nice job of explaining how that is a mo most consistent worldview throughout your different various arguments for what exists and why people are the way they are. The other one is, is Dawkins is, is having the first cell dropped off by aliens. And then, of course, those aliens had to be evolved from somewhere else, which is almost comical to me at this point um, that he would go there. But I think that's one of the best quotes that he ever made was that aliens dropped off the first cell. So, now, you know, it's, it's fascinating that even Richard Dawkins, the arch um, evolutionist, uh, said that nobody has any idea how life evolved. And he's, you know, he's caught on tape saying, uh, well, could, could it be aliens? Yes. They just have to be evolved aliens, that's all. And, and, and see, once, once he says that, you realize that the entire opposition to intelligent design has nothing to do with whether it's really a scientific theory or not, or whether it even um, could reasonably be correct. It has to do with where they think it's going and they don't want to go there. And to me, once, once you start saying that, what you're doing is you've displayed your prejudices. And I think that uh, um, that their prejudices should not be respected any more than ours are. And in fact, it's arguable that they might ought to be respected less. Um, <clears throat> I don't really have any sympathy for evolution at all, of course. But they are just trying to do something. They're trying to take all the evidence and put it together into a theory. That's what they're doing. Now we can poo-poo that, their theory or whatever. But we've got the same problem when we take the Bible and 
take all the evidence and put it together so it harmonizes with what the Bible says. Both sides have work to do, lots of work. Um, it's easier to point to the other guys and say, look, they're not doing very good either. But still, you know, it's still a, a process that's happening, and I don't think any of us are doing very well in it. Well, if science is basically the study of the unknown. The physical unknown. Um, but um, so it doesn't surprise me that nobody has all of the, uh, all of the theory completely correct. Um, that's something that our side takes solace in. That's something that their side takes solace in. And in fact, it's rather interesting to watch and see when you get them in a really tight spot. What they will say is basically. Well, we don't have the answer, but science is always advancing, and eventually we'll get there. Um, we never do that as theologians. Well, well, but of course, we know that we will all have all the answers one day in the new earth or in heaven when such questions can be answered with some certainty, when new data is forthcoming. The, the difference is that, that science is basing, considering only the evidence of the experimental uh, data. Uh, religion or faith also relies on revelation as evidence. You see, and revelation is something like saying, all right, I realize that I'm not complete in myself. There is a reality outside of me, and someone else could tell me something that is worth hearing and learning something from, and that someone else could also be God. Why is that such a, uh, how should I say, disallowed position? Well, I think that if you're not happy with uh, what you've heard about God, then you might. You know, I was amused by that wish fulfillment thing. Because there are people who wish for there to be no God. And C.S. Lewis makes his point very well. And if he says, then if you want, uh, the, the, you want there to be uh, a God so that th therefore you're, you're just doing this for wish fulfillment so it doesn't count, well, then if you don't want there to be a God, and Aldous Huxley plainly said that and said why, at least for some people, um, then you're also uh, uh, engaging in wish fulfillment. So if the psychology destroys the one, it destroys the other. Um, and, uh, and he said, well, but then it's because of your fear. But then the fear factor works on the other side too. So uh, you, you really need to toss those kind of arguments to the side. The question is, do you account for the evidence? That's the real question. And, uh, and since the evidence is not complete, I think there's a second order question is, how's your performance been in the past? And does it suggest that uh, we can continue on in the future? So that looking at the history of, you know, is science productively done by people who, who look this way, um, I think is an important thing. And that means we're back to arguing over the evidence again. Two things. We don't have too long to wait. This will all be made clear. Discover Magazine this month says ten, uh, has an article entitled 10 Years to Immortality. So we only have 10 years to wait. And then I listened to a doctor who said he takes 125 different pills a day for nutrition and science is eliminating diseases right and left. It's only a matter of time uh, when all will be made clear. 
The second point. Well, if you can uh, eat a, a thousand pills, maybe you can survive on the pills alone. Yes. <laughs> the, the other point is ex nihilo. Uh, we heard verses this morning that speak of that. Uh, Ellen White speaks clearly that God was not dependent upon pre-existing matter and what he did. Why is it that many Adventists are hung up at this point? Why can't we just all say, ex nihilo, that's it? Why, why do we have to say, but there was something here before that for the dinosaurs to eat and whatnot? Uh, why are we, I, I guess I'm confused as why we have to entertain pre-existing matter before the story of Genesis. Well, I think that, that the, the primary reason, frankly, is that there are a lot of people who have a great deal of respect for science. I happen to be one of them. I'm a physician. I learned about science. Um, and there are a lot of voices right now claiming that if you're going to be a good scientist, you have to believe in evolution. And so there is this, if you can put it that way, this 800-pound gorilla that's on their back. And as long as you pretend it's not there, you're not really dealing with the full issue. I think that's really what's going on. Uh, that pressure, I, I mean, one of the things that I think has been clear through these 10 chapters, and is even more clear if you think about what the survival of the fittest does to the principle of love, that the theological evidence is massively on one side. And the only way you can get around it is to discount it, frankly, is to say, well, Moses was a you know, country hick that didn't know what he was talking about. And in fact, it wasn't even Moses. It was actually some unknown Judites in uh, uh, maybe 700 BC or maybe 900 BC or something like that. And they just made it up. It sounded like a good story. And the more they told it, the better it got. And finally, they wrote it down. That's, you, you have to discount the evidence. And if you don't discount the evidence, the Bible is crystal clear. The problem is that people respect science and they're trying to accommodate this thing to science. And that's what's really going on. I think, um, and Green was um, the gentleman in front of me, yeah, we have to differentiate a little bit of what's going on with evolution, be how we use the term. Because just like the, the evolutionists try and use the term evolution for change within species and then just calmly move it right over to origin of species without making, you know, so feeling that the one proof. species including We also so need forth. to understand that for a lot of science, an evolutionary theory gives us a basis for their research and a methodology for doing their research and, and describing it, which helps them in whatever process they're doing that they could for me, they could do just as easily without that, but it gives them a framework for that. That's a little bit different in them looking at some natural processes that occur and trying to look at it in an evolutionary way from going then to, which is change in species over time, going flipping over to the origin of species. And I, we have to be careful, because I think some of what you're talking about with science dealing with it, they're, they're having a framework to work in their field that allows them to function if they don't believe in God, allows them to function and do research, which has its own legitimacy for what they're doing. It's when they flip over and try and make it so that we all have to believe in an origin of species difference and evolution and therefore discount God, et cetera, that we, we have exception. And I have exception, as many of us do, because they will not allow any other evidence. And I think that as the years go by, the evidence has become more and more in the favor of complexity and the requirement for there to be design behind it, the farther we go, and I think it will continue. And when you say we have to deal with the evidence, unfortunately right now, if the evidence doesn't fit a certain theory, they don't allow it. And that I disagree with. That's not the freedom of science. It's, it's no matter where you are on global warming, there's certainly been manipulation of the data in order to fit one theory or another. And one of my objections is with the evolutionary push of those that want an origin of species and eliminate the supernaturals, they will not allow 
things to be published. They will not allow to people to present things that disagree with that theory. And that certainly speaks of a real problem in their position, as it would for ours if we do not acknowledge the things that do not fit our creation story. I have problems with the origin of light from light years, millions, billions of years away if everything had to exist, uh, the, all the stars occurred on the fourth day. Now some people don't have a problem with that, but I have a problem scientifically and intellectually accepting the fact that God created all the light waves, including the stars that, that we observe blowing up, even though they didn't blow up because he created the light waves and not the star that blew up. That's a problem for me, and it is. You mean more like uh, supernovae that we right. see now? So, for someone like me, it is more comfortable to say, to look at the text and say, I'm not sure the text actually demands that everything in existence came in into existence on the fourth day, except what did it mean? It was here without form and void. Something was here without form and void. So, I think those intellectual, honest questions while not having to deny your faith, are reasonable to have. And I think that's a lot of the questions that you mentioned, that we have to be honest about the ones that we can't answer. Well, and in that particular case, the Bible may not actually, uh, in, a, in a close reading, uh, specifically speak to that. Or, and, and some hints suggest that uh, there may be more time than, uh, uh, than one, uh, than one is can easily deduce from the from the uh, Genesis account itself. I think that uh, Richard Davidson covered that. I think pretty well. Uh, and I agree. I think we have to be really careful about making our th theories too specific uh, in areas where the Bible really is silent, or perhaps even suggests that uh, that it wasn't quite as simple as uh, ev everything in the entire universe six thousand years ago. I wouldn't argue against pre-existence because we know there were supposedly other beings in existence, other worlds before the creation of the earth. But it seems like the earth was a special project, a, a, an, an example or an illustration or, or a place where the outworking of the war in heaven would be confined or uh, who knows. Uh, my wife's theory is that if we understood what it means by war in heaven, maybe we would understand supernovas and, and some other things. We don't know the extent of that war between supernatural beings. But uh, it, to drag the earth out into a longer period of time, to me it detracts from the miracle of creation to say, yeah, he rearranged atoms and things, uh, you know, he, re he, he redid things for this experiment. May be true, but the, uh, the glory of that comment, he spoke and it was. You can't top that. Well, I think that, um, that the same thing is true of the, uh, of trying to make the light being diffused from the sun and then later on you can see the sun. And it's, a, it's an adequate theory, but it does kind of take out the, uh, the whole theological point that uh, God don't need no stinking sun, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Um, and so I'm, I'm at the point now where I favor the theological over the, um, over the mechanistic approach. Uh, and I, I think that it's easier, although I, I don't think I would make a uh, federal case over it, but I think it's easier to just simply say God was trying to demonstrate something theologically, and that's why he created in seven days, and that's why he created the light before the sun, is because he wanted people to understand that the sun was not necessary for light, that God was. And if you do that and then you put the sun really there and we just couldn't see it very well, what you do is you, you completely undermine the theological point. And so for me, the only way to really make that work is to say, well, that wasn't the theological point at all. And for all those who are hollering that this is a polemic uh, document, uh, I think you're stuck with it if that's the case. Uh, 
but saying that we need a creation model that's more sensitive to the requirements and the non-requirements of the biblical text, I think is a whole different thing from saying, uh, I, I think regardless of how you work that, you're stuck with the fact that if you have life for a long period of time, it's, uh, it's gonna be a major problem. And uh, I think that's where kind of the bottom line comes that, that uh, there's a huge gap between having a, an Earth, uh, I mean, a, a universe or even a solar system before uh, uh, God's uh, six day creation week and having a, a five billion year creation week. I think that's when you really start getting into trouble in terms of, but when you, when you do that, you have to mutilate the text so badly that it's not recognizable. And I think that's where you, I think one of the point of these whole 10 chapters is that theologically we're actually on very sound ground. The real question is what can we do about the uh, scientific evidence? And I guess that's where we're gonna be turning the next five uh, chapters. Don't you think, though, that um, you could reliably think that God uses some process in all his creation? Because if he just said, flashed things into existence, he'd kind of be talking to himself. And he doesn't really need to talk to himself. He already knows what he's doing. But if he uses a process somebody could watch him and actually learn from it. Well, so it makes me, makes me a little bit uncomfortable when people solve problems by just saying, he said, and then it popped into existence. Well, to be fair, I, I think that, that if Job 38 is at all correct, then when the creation happened, there were morning stars and sons of God that were capable of rejoicing while they watched. And if that's the case, then when God said something, it wasn't to no audience. There was actually an audience there. So they could see it and actually understand so could, something could, of it. Yeah, they could see, they could hear God saying, they could see processes happening. Um, and some of those were probably developmental processes. Let the earth bring forth, and God formed out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, which is not just speaking. Uh, apparently there was some, there, there is some process going on as well. But perhaps when God uh, does these kinds of things, he has, he says things. And then it's kind of like s s watching a master craftsman at work. And now I'm going to take this stuff and I'm going to turn it into a human. Watch. And now I'm going to do this. And now I'm going to do that. And the people realize that he had an intention doing it, and it happened that way. Uh, but in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, it seems to have come out of nothing. And in fact, that's the current best ev uh, uh, cosmological speculation, is that the universe popped into existence from literally nothing. In this chapter, I think the point that was clarified for me was the one about uh, dualism, the soul and the body being two separate things. I puzzled over how the Pope could be so supportive of evolution, how Billy Graham could be so supportive of evolution, and his comment that at some point in the evolutionary process, God gave a person a soul. Well, if you think that a soul is a separate thing, then God can do that. If you think the soul is part of who you are, then it doesn't make any sense at all. 
Well, that's right. And man became a living soul, so we are all living souls. And our bodies are part of that. Um, and that's one of the problems that I have with evolution trying to create people is it seems to reduce us to noth nothing, but, um, uh, nothing but nothing uh, but electrical currents in the brain and uh, chemical gradients. One of the issues I have with uh, with uh, theistic evolution uh, that I don't think you can get around is that it destroys Christology because you don't you cannot have death and dying going on, and then was it all of a sudden we now have a soul, and now all of a sudden we're judged by what we do, and so if we sin, now we have a reason for a redeemer. Well, not yep. only that. Uh, so apparently, when when we got a soul, we were then immortal. Yeah, it just doesn't fit Christology. One point I was going to make, though, that recently a, a group that I happen to like their stuff, that are strong defenders of of Genesis had an article in one of their journals about why people had to burn forever and ever, which is exactly the main reason I think most people reject Christianity that are so adamantly opposed to Christianity is that I too would be opposed to Christianity if my vision of a God was someone that would torture people forever and ever. And uh, I feel it's very unfortunate that so many of those in Christianity um, believe in that because I think that pushes more anti-theist and anti-Christians to their position than probably anything else out there. That's true and in fact Antony Flew didn't come back to Christianity because of that. He is quoted as saying that if he, had, if he did become a Christian he'd have to be somebody like Jehovah's Witnesses. Why? Because Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in an ever-burning hell. Right. Interesting. By the way, there's one other thing, and, and I think I'll quit with this. You may have noticed those references to Brother Yoon. How many of you have ever heard of Brother Yoon? One. Two. Fascinating story. He's a, um, see if I can put this, this uh, I hadn't run into it before then, which I guess shows my a big hole in my knowledge base, but um, he's a house church member. He's a very conservative house church member, probably partly because of his experiences. Uh, the Chinese government didn't like him because he wasn't part of the Three Self Movement, which is the Chinese government's controlled church. And um, they imprisoned him a number of times, including once where they were trying to make sure that he never got out of prison. Put him in a maximum security uh, prison. I think he jumped out of a window trying to escape, hurt his feet, and uh, so they uh, decided to beat his feet further. Winding up, he, he wound up being a cripple, had to be carried around by people because his, his Feet and legs were just totally messed up. And um, one day, he, uh, I think somebody else got a message from God first, and then he got a message from God. And exactly how those happen, you'll have to talk to them, uh, because I'm not sure I can tell you how that works. But they did. That it, he was to get out of prison. And so he started out on the day he was supposed to do it. And then he walked through a gate, walked through another gate, walked through a third gate. I mean, it starts to sound like acts, you know. And then he got on a bicycle. And somewhere in the middle of that, he realized that his legs were working. Uh, he escaped out of the prison. Uh, he managed to get out of China proper after about six months or something like that. There was this big investigation as to why he got out. The Chinese government wanted him back once he reached, eventually lived in Germany for a while. 
I don't know where he still is. Uh, he may still be in Germany. But it's a matter of public record that he was inside the prison and that he got out. And the, when the uh, Chinese investigating uh, team found everything out they could, they said that he didn't have help. <laughs> How you do that is not clear. So, you know, when people have experiences of that kind, or they know personally of people who've had experiences of that kind, the kinds of arguments that say we are going to explain the entire universe without regard to the supernatural kind of fall on deaf ears. And perhaps, I, you know, I hear William Johnson making the case for people who have had the experience of Christ in their hearts. And I think he is also making the case that the Age of Miracles is not completely dead. And I suspect that atheism is, in fact, a diversion, that it is not the final deception. And that, in fact, most atheists will fold when presented by absolutely clear evidence that the entire project that they've been working on is invalid. Now, that won't mean that there won't be people trying to use long ages and theistic evolution to describe what's been going on. But it does suggest that pure atheism may have its days numbered. And I'll leave that, that thought with you. Uh, next week we will be uh, talking about, I think I just lost it. Well, it didn't die though. Um, next week we'll be talking about uh, uh, Tim Standish's chapter for those of you who are reading along.